very well. What I'd like to look at now is the true role that microbes play in disease. And the antibiotic question is um, uh, a real one. When I mentioned that 1% of doctors are referring that antibiotics are causing more problems than they ever cured, what do I mean by that and what do they mean by that? When you take an antibiotic into your body, you're actually putting a mold waste into your body as I showed you. And how many people have had antibiotics and then they get thrush? Yeah? Or a mother has antibiotics and her baby gets thrush because you're putting a mould waste into your body. That's what the doctors are referring to. And there's a link today linking cancer with fungus. And if you put fungus and cancer into the web, you'll get a, a whole area of things. I have a few books at my health retreat that are from dif different doctors, different professors over the world that are showing this. You see, Louis Pasteur believed in monomorphism. Mono means one, morphism, one form. Louis Pasteur, he presented that it only ever is a bacteria and it only ever will be a bacteria. But there are, is another class of people who believe that in pleomorphism, pleo means many, meaning it's not just ever going to be a bacteria. Under, the, under different conditions, this bacteria can change into yeast and fungus and we know in the cycle of life that's exactly what it does. Unfortunately, in medicine today, because the pharmaceutical companies play a large role in what doctors are taught, and what doctors are taught are basically based on the germ theory, and for doctors to acknowledge or medicine as a whole, the role of yeast and fungus in disease, they would also have to acknowledge that some of their main drugs are putting it into the body, like your antibiotics, like your statin drugs, like your contraceptive pill, like your cortisones. But as you can see by what I showed you, with the basic foundation of the cycle of life, it's important to understand that so that you understand the role that they play in disease. Now, yeast and fungus, they can get into the body in four ways. It can get into the body through inhalation. So if you've got a mouldy orange in your fruit bowl, don't touch it because it can get in through your skin. So what do you do? You actually put a mask on, get some tongs, pick it up and <laughs> dispose of it outside the house. It's, it's toxic stuff, so you can inhale it, you can ingest it, don't touch anything that has mould on it because mould is toxic. Now if a person has strong hydrochloric acid, it can actually kill the mould. But as you'll see on Friday night when I look at the gut, not a lot of people have strong hydrochloric acid anymore. If someone says to me, I've got, I've got too much acid in my stomach, I say, I say fantastic because that's what breaks your protein down. But I've actually never met anyone with too much acid. I'd say to someone, how do you know it's acid? Well, it keeps coming up. Well, that's not the acid. The problem is the little gate there. And the little gate, if it's working well, should stop any acid coming up. Now, what you have to go way back to is why, why are these things so? Why are these things happening? So four ways mole can get into your stomach, through inhalation, through ingestion, through the skin, and also sexually. And when it comes into the body, it can, it can play havoc in the body. And there's a book that I have called The Germ That Causes Cancer, and it's by Doug Kaufman, who works with a uh, Dr. Dr. Holland. The Germ That Causes Cancer. And he has a chapter that goes through the streams of time, 19th century, through the streams of time, 20th century. And he shows that when we went from the 19th to the 20th century, medicine and science alike agreed that cancer was a fungus. So what happened? Well, in the early 19, uh, so from the 19th to the early mid 1900s, um, the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds came in and where did they fund the research to go? To chemotherapy, to radiotherapy, to surgery. So in cancer treatments today, you've got slash, poison and burn. I mean surgery and chemotherapy and radiotherapy. 
Between 1998 and 2004, Dr. Graham Morgan, who's an oncologist from North Shore Hospital in Sydney, and another couple of Sydney oncologists, they had a look at chemotherapy and they found that five years after chemotherapy there was a two and a half percent survival rate. Now th that is shocking news. Now not every cancer has such a low survival rate but I, get, I think the highest survival rate was just something like um, five years after chemo maybe a 10 or 20 percent survival rate. There are people that survive after chemo but most of the time it's because they've changed their life. They've changed their lifestyle. You see, if you don't turn the tap off, you're going to still be mopping up in the other corner. And one person said to me, Barbara, you can't blame everything on fungus. Well, the fact is, fungus is just an opportunist organism. It's just going to be around where it is well fed. How do you know if fungus is in the body? And by the way, you can have a yeast problem in the body and not have cancer, but it certainly can develop to cancer if it's given the right conditions. So how do you know? Your tongue is a good guide. Your tongue should be pink from the tip to the back. And if it is coated and you can scrape the coat off, that is waste. But if you can't scrape the coat off, that's a, they are little fungus buds on the back of the tongue. So we've looked at how it can come into the body. Now I'd like to show you how you can get it out of the body. But before I do that, let me tell you one story that shows the, the danger of mould. And a lot of people don't realise how dangerous this stuff is. And this is why I have written a book on the subject. In the book, Self Heal by Design, up the back, The Role of Microorganisms in Disease, I basically explore what you're hearing tonight in greater detail. And I have the research and a little bit more of the background around it. Now, this happened. Uh, Five years ago, it happened in a little town of Toowoomba in Queensland. There was a silo that had water damage. So what happens in a silo when there's water damage? Mould. So what do they do with the mouldy grain? Well, you can't feed humans. And you know that not even a pig will eat mouldy grain. They've even coated it with molasses and won't eat it. So well, what are we going to do with this mouldy grain? Oh, we'll make beer out of it. So then we're left with, once the roof was fixed on the silo, then, then the inside of the silo, which was white, what's the white? Mould had to be cleaned. So three men were asked to do it. The three men had a look at it. Two of the men said, I'm going to put protective clothing on. The third man said, ah, oh, this won't take long. <laughs> so the two men went off to get their clothing on and the third man went in with the shovel to start shoveling off this white mouldy build up on the walls of the silo. When the two men came back they looked like they were about to walk on Mars. They were totally covered with breathing apparatus. They came into the room and their friend was lying down. They ran over to him. He was dead. What happened to him? When he put the shovel in he caused a, a big release <laughs> of this mould waste. It went in through his skin. He breathed it. He swallowed, basically, he had an anaphylactic reaction and he died. So this, this stuff is toxic. That man obviously had a big overload. And you've probably heard and maybe experienced that in schools today, peanuts are banned. Does that happen in New Zealand? Certainly in Australia. Do you know there's nothing wrong with a peanut? Peanuts are not a nut, they are a legume and they grow in the ground. So they mould very, very easily. And it is not the peanut that kills, it's the mould waste on the peanut. And the peanut grows a mould called aspergillus and it gives off a mould waste called aflatoxin. Aflatoxin is the most carcinogenic substance that has ever been tested. Now different moulds have effects on different body parts. And the China study, which is a book by Dr Colin Campbell, he shows in there that children were dying in the Philippines between 8 and 10 years of age from liver cancer and they traced it to the aflatoxin in the peanut butter. <laughs> and he came to the conclusion that it must be the poorer children that were dying but it was the wealthy children that were dying and the wealthy children were, were eating what Time magazine called the meat sweet diet. <laughs> A high meat, high sweet and yet the the children in the country were eating a natural diet of um, lots of greens and maybe seaweeds and 
little bit of fish, little bit of soy, and they were not dying. And this shocked Colin Campbell because he was trained in med school that you've got to have meat for your protein and, and you've got to have dairy for your calcium. But he found in his research that he could switch cancer on or off by the amount of meat and dairy products that he was giving the rats. Just incredible. In fact, he would inject them all with aflatoxin. And the ones on 5% animal protein did not get the cancer. The ones on 20% animal protein were all, all died from, from the liver cancer. And he would take do another research. He'd give the rats 5% animal protein for the first year, no cancer. Second year, he'd twist it out, he'd change it to 20% animal protein, they all died of liver cancer. So can you see he could turn cancer on and off? Again, genetic slows the gun, lifestyle pulls the trigger. But here, it's the germ. He injected every rat with aflatoxin. In other words, they'll only live where they're getting well fed. So how do we get this out of the body? Number one, you've got to starve it. What's its favourite food? The favourite food basically is sugar. Yeast loves sugar and it also is fed by yeast as well. Now if someone has a yeast presence in their body, and the most common ones are a vaginal itch, anal itch, athlete's foot, rashes, it can go further to uh, gut problems, it can go further to um, psoriasis, to eczema, etc, etc. In fact, someone said, what's the signs of a yeast presence in the body? I said, how long's a piece of string? You know, there's, <laughs> there's huge amounts and it depends on our strengths and our weaknesses, our lifestyle, etc, etc. That's why you're the doctor. And so if someone comes to me wanting to eliminate uh, yeast out of the body, I say go on very low, sh low fruit. Say Granny Smith apple and grapefruit. In my book there are programs for it. But it, particularly in this lecture, we'll go one step further. What about uh, someone that has cancer? Well, if someone has cancer, want conquering cancer I call it, <coughs> no fruit for six weeks. And sometimes this program is called the sledgehammer program because it's designed to give a sledgehammer approach to cancer, to really knock it out. Dr. Otto Warburg in the 40s got a Nobel Prize for proving that cancer loves an environment with high sugar and no oxygen. And there's a part of your cell that runs like that. Let's go to the CBD and I'll be pursuing this more in other lectures. Once the glucose goes into the body, there's a 20-step pathway. And this 20-step pathway that processes the glucose gives two units of energy. And it's an anaerobic. Anaerobic means no oxygen. Now the end re result of the 20-step pathway produces a chemical form of glucose called pyruvate. And pyruvate gets fed into what's called the powerhouse because the eight-step pathway gives us 36 units of energy. And this is the aerobic pathway, meaning the oxygen pathway. Now this 20-step pathway is very fast. It consumes huge amounts of glucose. And this is where a cancer cell runs. No oxygen, lots of sugar. When this pathway is being used, and this is a slow pathway, um, it uses a lot of oxygen and it, it can run without high sugar because it takes a little while to get down there. Can you see that? Everything we eat has sugar. Everything we eat. But the high fruit, high sugars, one lady said to me, I know what was feeding my cancer. She, I, she said, I used to make pavlovas for church. 16 cups of white sugar in a pavlova that big. Think of that next time someone offers you a <coughs> slice of pavlova. Eat the fruit on top. So this is what Dr. Otto Wilber got a Nobel Prize for, showing that cancer cells, cancer cells basically are running up here. So you give a cancer cell lots of sugar, even a high fruit diet, it's just going to feed it. Cancer cannot live in the presence of oxygen. That's what Dr. Otto Warburg 
discovered. Now, check it out in the anatomy and physiology books. This is the glycolytic pathway. And the glycolytic pathway is an important pathway because that produces the fuel needed for the eight-step pathway. But if a lot of sugar's going in <clears throat> and no oxygen, can you see that this is just where it can stay running? And so <clears throat> to, starve the, the, to starve the cancer, cut out all the sugar, cut out all the yeast, and no fruit for six weeks. Now because the person's eating a lot of vegetables, legumes, nuts, seeds, they're getting the fuel for the cell to run down there. That's how it should run. One lady said, but Barbara, fruit's good. I said, it's fantastic. But if a person's got cancer, they need to, to drastically reduce that for a period of time. What happens after six weeks? Then after six weeks, they go on what I call stage one antifungal diet. They can start eating grapefruit, Granny Smith apples. They also go very low, <coughs> which I'll cover when I look at diabetes. <coughs> Excuse me. They go very low on the, on the carbohydrates. But they can have lots of dal, legumes, lots of vegetables, nuts and seeds. Also, <coughs> you've got to search the house that there's no mould. There can be no mould. When I was in the Qantas Club waiting for a flight, I was reading the Australian and I was, I was taken, my attention was taken to an article that said, my doctor said I've got to get out of my house. I'm immediately interested. <laughs> she was living in an apartment and the apartment was mouldy. And then they investigated and found out that every apartment was mouldy. Whoever did the bathrooms didn't properly um, waterproof them. And then they discovered that one man, his, his whole kitchen roof fell in. It just totally rotted from mould. The people in that set of apartments were sick. There was a high cancer rate in there. And notice what this lady said, my doctor says I've got to get out of my house. I thought, wow, it's refreshing to see there's an acknowledgement there. It's toxic stuff. Number two. Basically, this is turning the tap off. Number two, kill. I do think we've got to get away from the kill mentality, but there are herbs that will kill cancer, kill mold, and will not kill you. Isn't that good news? And in my book, there's a whole list of them. So things like olive leaf extract, grapefruit seed extract, Portiaco. Portiaco is a South American herb, strong anti-fungal killer. And in New Zealand, there's a herb that we Australians use called horopito. Have you heard of the herb horopito? That's very strong anti-fungal. What I suggest people do is a fortnight on that, a fortnight on this, a fortnight on that. You alternate it. Because of the body's amazing ability and the microbes' ability to adapt and adjust, you keep changing it. <laughs> you keep changing it. So number three, balance. Bring back the balance in the gastrointestinal tract and flood the gastrointestinal tract with the good guys. There's your probiotic. One of the questions I was asked, so I'll answer it now, is um, what probiotic brand do I suggest? I am not familiar with your New Zealand ones, but you basically just go for a vegetarian probiotic. And the best time to take it is three quarters of an hour before breakfast, so that it'll go way down where it should go. Don't have it with your meal because when you start eating, the valve at the bottom of your stomach, the pyloric sphincter shuts, and your hydrochloric acid is really strong and it can wipe out your probiotics and you want them way down. So three quarters of an hour before breakfast, early morning is the best time for them. Number four, alkalize. Cancer and fungus love an acid environment. So it makes sense to alkalize the body. I have a book in my library called Cancer is a Fungus and it's by an Italian oncologist named Dr. Tullio Simoncini. Now this oncologist has been having 90% success rate and what he does, he injects the cancer with sodium bicarbonate. So sodium bicarbonate's the 
the ultimate alkalizer. In fact, in the lining of your stomach there's sodium bicarb in case any stomach acid gets through and your pancreas releases sodium bicarb to neutralize the acid coming out of the stomach. Did you know that? And in agriculture they will spray fungus on plants with sodium bicarb and our grandmothers cleaned up mouldy bathrooms with sodium bicarb. So some people say, well should I drink sodium bicarb? No, all that'll do is neutralize your stomach acid and there's one place and one place only where in your body that should be acid. Students, stomach. It's only in an acid environment, as you'll find out on Friday night when we go on the journey, going through the gastrointestinal tract. Now the only time I would suggest taking sodium bicarb would be if someone had stomach cancer and then they could take it just before bed. You see, your hydrochloric acid is produced when you think, smell, taste food. Basically, the brain says, it's coming, come on guys, produce the hydrochloric acid. So when you wake up in the morning, it's not there and it's not active. It only comes when the brain says it's time because it's got food messages from your eyes, from your nose, from your, <laughs> when you sit down to eat a meal. So when I sat down at lunchtime to a lovely plate of beans and chickpeas and cucumbers and avocados, my brain, without me even conscious of it, was already giving messages to my mouth and stomach to start producing the things. You see, your eyes and your smell are all giving messages into your brain. The brain's an amazing thing, headquarters. So what I'm talking about is alkalizing the tissues, basically where, where your, your cells function. And one of the most alkalizers, alkalizing substances you can take in is the lemon. You might say, no, lemon's acid. It's acid where it should be, that's its great digestive aid. Put it on your fruit salad, put it on your green salad. But when it is split in the gut and the minerals are separated and taken into the body, basically and into the tissues, the lemon's high in alkalizing minerals, so it alkalizes the tissue. So lemon's acid where it should be, alkaline where it should be. That's why a great drink early in the morning is lemon, warm lemon water alkalizes the tissues and lemon is a great uh, liver, liver herb. So alkalize. What are the most alkalizing foods? Dark, green, leafy, vegetables are very alkaline. All your vegetables are alkalizing. And watermelon, well if you've got cancer, oh yes we don't want watermelon. Again Fruits can be alkalizing, but if you've got cancer, you've got that balance. They're alkalizing, but they're actually feeding, the sugar's feeding the, can the yeast, which actually gives off acid. So there's that, that whole balancer. When someone comes to our retreat wanting help to conquer cancer, we blend up wild greens with water and strain it and we and they drink a litre of that a day. So green drinks. Green drinks alkalize from the inside inside. And now there's a specific treatment that we do at Misty and it's the hyperbaric chamber. I don't know if you've heard of the hyperbaric chamber. The hyperbaric chamber was developed to help um, divers that had bends. You see, in air, air is 21% oxygen and about 79% nitrogen. So when the diver goes down under pressure and comes up too quickly, nitrogen goes into little gases in the joints and that's the bends. You've probably heard of the bends. So they developed the hyperbaric chamber which um, under pressure, oxygen, is taken into the blood, the little nitrogen dissolve and basic, or you know, they're, they're broken up and they're breathed out. Cancer cannot live in the presence of oxygen, so going into a hyperbaric chamber increases the oxygen content. And when you've got more oxygen, can you see that your cells are going to go down to here? And look, 18 times more energy the, the human body will experience when the cell can get down to the, to what's called the mitochondria, the Krebs cycle. Uh, Henry's law states 
that under pressure more gas goes into a liquid. So in the hyperbaric chamber the gas is oxygen and the liquid is blood. So uh, they're looking at hyperbaric chambers now in cancer treatment. Also, some hospitals have whole rooms that are hyperbaric chamber. We've just got like a tent that you know you close it up and you pump it up and it's like a little pressurized tent. People come out and they've got lots of energy because they've got lots of energy and the cells get down to there. Um, so that's part, that can be part of the treatment and also we do sodium bicarbonate wraps. Dr. Tullio Simoncini injects it into the cancer. Well, we're not going to inject it into the cancer, but we do wraps. And when we do the wraps, it's a, quite a specialised treatment. It's about two kilos of sodium bicarbonate and five litres of water and half a cup of lemon juice. And then you dip towels in it and wring the towels out. Um, now, I've only just thought of it now, but we might be able to demonstrate that. Um, let's say we're doing natural remedies um, Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. Okay, well, we'll, we'll demonstrate that on the Friday one because there's a little bit of preparation to be able to do that, but it's quite an intensive treatment. And uh, the first, so hot towels wrapped around the torso and then covered. And then the, another hot wet towel around this leg, then that leg, then this arm, then that arm, and then it's all covered and they're wrapped up for one hour. So basically what's happening is with someone that's got cancer, you're stopping everything that can feed it, you're taking the herbs that will kill off the yeast, you're balancing the gut with the probiotic, you're taking the green drinks which are alkalizing from the inside, taking the hyperbaric, and that's not always possible, but if possible, and being wrapped up in the sodium bicarbonate wraps. And the sodium bicarb basically is coming in through the skin and helping to alkalize. When people come to our retreat, I say, basically cancer hasn't got a chance in your body. You see, the body heals itself. We've just got to give it the right conditions. So let me tell you the story about Elizabeth Cott that came to us two and a half years ago. She's in her mid-60s and she had three large tumours in her abdomen. <coughs> and her doctor said, this is a very aggressive cancer, you have to begin chemotherapy straight away. <coughs> she wanted to think about it. And someone gave her one of my lectures on cancer. So she rang us up and she booked in. She stayed for two weeks and we did five, because they're one hour treatments, we did five wraps the first week and five wraps the second week. At that point we did not have our hyperbaric chamber. Stopped all fruit, went on lots of vegetables, legumes, nuts, seeds, gave her herbs to kill, balanced it. She had green drinks every day. She felt very good. She went back to the doctor three months later and he tested her. All her inflammatory markers had come down. She felt fantastic. After three months, she'd lost 10 kilos. She was looking great. She was off her blood pressure medication. All these other things fixed up. She was no longer on her sleep apnea machine. Doctor looked at her tests and he just said, keep, keep doing what you're doing and I'll see you in six months. Now, what did he say three months before? You, you've got to do something straight away. He didn't know what was going on. So she went back and it was six months later. So we're looking at about almost a year time frame now. And he uh, did a scan on her abdomen and one of the tumours had totally gone. She went back another six months later and the other tumour had totally gone. <laughs> she said to me, the other tumour's there but it's not growing, it's not doing anything. And she said, when I go to see the oncologist now, he sa she said, there are two oncologists and a specialist and they're just standing looking at it. <laughs> they, they don't know what's going on, but um, they just can't believe what's happening with her. Now, she was the, the dessert maker at church. Remember the 16 cups of white sugar in a pavlova? She said, when they asked me to make pavlovas now, she said, no, I'm not going to make that. I love you too much. <laughs> She said, but I will make apple crumble, or I will make apple pie or apple strudel. She's Polish. Beautiful cook. And whereas she used to put butter and cream in her dishes, she puts olive oil and coconut cream in the dishes now, and I've eaten at her house beautiful food. She's just, she's just replaced um, the things she used to, 
to, to make with other things and the food is still, still very, very beautiful. Now, Elizabeth eats much like I do now. She, she does have some fruit now. But, you know, she's had remarkable responses and she lives in Melbourne and she now gives classes teaching people natural remedies, teaching people how to eat. She's an incredible illustration of, um, of what can happen in the body when you give it the right conditions. It's two and a half years later now, she says to me, I'm almost 70 and I feel better than I, f than I felt in my 40s. You see, there is a formula and if you give the body the right conditions, you will get the results. We had another lady come and her name was Emily and she'd had, uh, she'd had brain cancer two years before. They gave her a lot of radiotherapy and chemotherapy and it went into remission. You see, chemotherapy does kill cancer but it also kills the good cells. So it's a little bit of a gamble, will I survive this thing? If the body's designed to heal itself, we don't need to kill off the good stuff, we need to build up the good stuff. The doctor said that she was cured, but a year later she got breast cancer. They came in again with the radio and the chemotherapy and took her breast. They said she was cured. Two years later, they discovered she had liver cancer and bone cancer. I would like to um, ask a question now, is it working? You see, the same blood that goes through the liver goes through the brain, goes through the breast. They started chemo again and all her fingernails went black. All her hair fell out and the doctor got a little bit scared. He said, um, we'll put it on hold for another month. And then she heard about us and her family put together to enable her to come. She sat in front of me and she said, I know that God sent me here and whatever you tell me to do, I will do. I love that. <laughs> You see, where there's a will, there's a way. And she did everything. Do you know, the first time her walking was like this, she was only in her mid-40s. She was with us for two weeks. After the second wrap, her lockjaw released. She'd had lockjaw ever since the chemo. Ever since the chemo, she'd been un unable to perspire. She started to perspire just bit by bit by bit. We saw incredible results in this lady. The people were with her on the first week, couldn't believe she was the same woman at the end of the week. She was with us for two weeks. You know, at the end of the second week, she was, she was up ahead of everyone on the exercise program. The results were just incredible. Now the man that is our maintenance man sometimes does our trips to the airport. He drove Emily into the airport. She was very, very quiet, so she didn't say much. But I was giving her a colonic irrigation on the second week and I was massaging quite deeply her, her abdomen. She looked at me and she said, I wouldn't have let you touch my abdomen with your little finger 10 days ago. And now I was massaging it heavily with my fist. I said, what were your pain levels when you came? Oh, I didn't want to tell you, but they were at 8, 9 out of 10. I said, what are they now? She said, 1 out of 10. That was in 10 days. So the man that drove her to the airport, he came back. He sat down into my, in my kitchen a few hours later. I said, what is it, Jeff? He said, this woman has just told me her story. She just told me what she was, and she just told me what she is now. He said, I've never heard anything like it, because he's out fencing. He looked at me and he said, I, I want to work for you people for the rest of my life. <laughs> Incredible. Emily was given three months to live. Emily lived another six years. When she went back to the doctor a year later, the, the tumour on her liver had totally gone. What she really battled with was the tumour in her bones, in her lower spine. I think if Emily hadn't had to go back to the city and as a single mother deal with some troublesome teenagers, I think she might have even made it longer. But remember, she'd had many bouts of chemo, which are very poisoning to the body, but she was overjoyed that she got another six years. But in that six years, she got quality of life, and it was really only near the end. She deteriorated quickly, and that was, that was a great blessing. I had another lady come to me, exactly the same age, exactly the same situation, and she's in front of me and she's crying. I said, why are you crying? She said, I don't want to be here. I said, I've never had anyone say that. <laughs> I said, well, why are you here? Oh, my mother and my sister insist that I come. 
I said, but you know you have liver and bone cancer. Well, she said, I don't feel like I have. I just want to live my life. So I said, would you like us to drive you home? You see, a man convinced against his will will be of the same opinion still. She said, oh, I'll stay. And everything we did, oh, all right. We'd give her a green drink, she'd take a mouthful and just leave it. <laughs> and she went, and then she went home. And Michael and I had mixed up the computers. She'd got ours and we had hers. So we went back to her house a few hours later and Michael knocked on the door and he could smell the meat cooking later on. <laughs> her mother rang us up and she said, I can see she's not interested. She died three months later. Exact same situation as Emily had. So you see with this lady, there was a mind thing. The, the mind is very important. Remember what Emily said? Whatever you say, I will do. And what this lady say? I don't want to be here. <laughs> so there's a mind as well. And I want to tell you another story about a man who came to us from Melbourne and he had prostate cancer. And he was 56. He was not that interested in coming, but his wife and his daughter were keen. So his wife was about 54. His daughter was about <clears throat> 28. And so I went through things in the consultation. We can do this. And he went, oh, yeah. And his wife and his daughter said, yeah, yeah, we'll do it. You'll do it, won't you, Dad? Yeah, Dad, yeah, Dad. So that they had all the go. And he was, oh, righto, righto. Everything we did, will you do this? Oh, righto, righto. But his wife and daughter were saying, yeah, he'll do it, he'll do it. So he had this, you know, fan club in the back town that was moving along. He stayed for two weeks. Uh, in our final consultation, I said, well, I suggest this. He was, oh, I suppose. And his wife and daughter, yeah, yeah, he'll do it, he'll do it. They went home and he did it purely because he had a wife and a daughter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He emailed me three months later. He said, I've just had a test and I'm cancer free. Now he's interested. <laughs> Interesting story. He was just, oh, righto, righto. Not really gung-ho like his wife and his daughter were. Um, amazing stories. What I find when people come to us wanting help with cancer, I find that there are turnarounds in, this, in some of the stories that I've just told you. With some people like Emily, I find three months is extended to six years. And for some people where it's very advanced, I find the last days made more comfortable. And so whatever the outcome, you can see there's a plus. And for a few people that have come at very late stages, um, they have passed within a few months and their wife, their daughters have contacted us and said, thank you so much. Thank you so much because our time at Misty was a joy and dad or mum, sister was able to pass without near the suffering that we know that they would have had. So whatever the outcome, and I can never predict. Some people that I think, oh dear, they have turnarounds. And some people I think, you know, I, I think we might have a go there. It doesn't quite, uh, there are so many factors that come in. Some people say, what's your success rate? I said, well, and you can't do double blind st studies because my daughter's got twins and they're like chalk and cheese. You can't even do studies on twins because there's so many different things. And you might have identical twins and think, yeah, we can do a study on this, but one was sexually abused and the other wasn't. You see, and, and that, can, that can tip the scales. And I've met women who've developed inflammatory breast cancer after finding out their daughter was violently raped. So you see, there's this emotional thing that also comes into the equation. And then there's Doug. Doug came to us with prostate cancer for two weeks. In the initial consultation, I said, um, did you have a happy, healthy childhood? He said, no, my father yelled at me all my life. He yelled at me. I thought, righto, OK. All week he was, you could see the frown and he would tell everyone about what happened in his childhood. After he heard the lecture on forgiveness, I went to him and I said, well, Doug, have you forgiven your father? He said, you don't understand. He said, all my life I was yelled at. I said, but Doug, you've got to do it. You don't understand. I said, Doug, it'll take a minute. I was pushing him. I knew I was pushing him, but I knew that if he didn't let this go, he would never heal. No matter doing all of this. So I, was pu I knew I was flexing my muscles a bit in pushing him. I said, Doug, it'll take a minute. You don't understand. So I backed off. 
and changed the subject. Three minutes later, he said, I've done it. <laughs> I said, great. Notice what he said, I've done it. I will define this on Saturday, that forgiveness is not a feeling, it is a choice. Because I'd like to suggest, how could you ever feel like it? The law of the mind states that your feelings come after you've done it. Do you know, all that week, Doug had a smile. No one else heard the story of his father yelling at him all week. And as I'll show you on Saturday, there are little cells in your brain that start to, to detoxify it and clean it up just because you forgive. Isn't that amazing? I tell you these stories because there are so many factors that come in. So many factors. And especially with prostate cancer and also with breast cancer, there's a hormone factor. Because if the hormones were balanced, then that wouldn't happen. But it's not always a hormone factor. Can you see that? Not always a hormone factor. And there is a cream called the Anna's Wild Yam Cream that is able to balance the hormones. Number, number six. But before I go to number six, let me just tell you one story that illustrates what happened with a lady. She's a lady doctor from South Australia. She's 60. She rang me. She said, Barbara, I've just found out I've got breast cancer. I've got a five centimetre lump in my breast. Sorry, three centimetres. She said, what can I do? I said, go on the Anna's Wild Yam Cream to help balance that because the high oestrogen feeds the tumour in the breast. And there are many things that cause a disruption of that. I said, and get a panty liner and put some castor oil on it and just slip it in your bra where the lump is. Castor oil penetrates deeper than any other oil. In the lecture tomorrow we'll be looking at castor oil in the natural remedies. If you're unable to come, if you go to Barbara O'Neill Poultice YouTube, the, the lecture is there. Castor oil penetrates deeper than any other oil. There's a book called The Oil That Heals and the whole book is on castor oil and it was written by a doctor who's using it in his practice. I said, keep that on as much as you can. Every day, put a little bit more oil on. She, rang, she uh, rang back a month later and booked into our program. So she came to our program about three months after we'd had the conversation. And when we're having our initial consultation, she said, a month after you talked to me, I decided to go and have the lump cut out. She said that when I came out of surgery, my doctor said, you know, it's really strange. That lump was three centimetres, but it was only two centimetres when we took it out. You see, reducing the oestrogen had stopped feeding it and the castor oil was starting to break it down. And she told the other guests and they said, well, why did you have the surgery? She said, well, I didn't know <laughs> till the lump was out that that's, that's what it was doing. So can you see what we're looking at here? There's not only a hormone factor balancing the hormones, there can also be poultices that you can do. With breast cancer, absolutely the poultices can happen. But number seven is a mineral supplement called Ormus, or Ormis. You can put that into the web and have a look at it, but it's orbitally rearranged monoatomic elements, and you don't have to repeat that back to me. But basically it's minerals in a monoatomic form that have been dropped out of seawater. In my book Self Heal Design there's a chapter on genetics in the last two pages. It's a description of it. But the research is showing that these minerals can heal DNA damage. So can you see we're looking at it from several different angles there. We're looking at it dietary, we're looking at it also, which I haven't mentioned there, is lifestyle, which we'll be looking at through the week, drinking more water, exercise. We're looking at bringing balance into the gut. We're looking at alkalizing. We're looking at the, the hormone factor, if it's, if it's prostate or breast cancer or, or cervical cancer or ovarian, if it's a hormone factor. And we're also looking at poultices, which also help to give the body the, the, the environment for healing and healing the DNA. Now I did say we'd open the floor for questions, but I've got a little group here that we're going to have a look at. And there's one that I'd like to look at first, 
which covers a little bit of what we're looking at. One is, um, is does potting mix really kill you? Where was that one? Why would potting mix kill students? Mold, yeah. And some potting mixes have more mold than others. So really, if you're dealing with it, you must wear a mask. And again, that mould can get into your body and it's not an easy thing to get rid of it. And in my book it outlines it and we've outlined it also there. So does potting mix really kill you? Well, it can. <laughs> and if someone's got cancer, they shouldn't go anywhere near potting mix or wear a big mask. Um, and another one here that I read, a lady was living in a mouldy house. After mould, being, there was mould under the floors in the house, lived there for 10 years, not knowing there was mould under the floorboards. Out of it now, will I still be affected by that mould? Will my DNA heal? Yes, it will. <laughs> but it must be given the right conditions. And if someone has had an experience like that, it's important to go through a specific program to, to rid, it out, rid it out of the body. So there might be a little yeast still in the body, but if it's fed sugar, if it's fed a high carbohydrate diet, if it's on a lot of fruit, um, you can see it's just an opportunist organisms. These are just op opportunist organisms. They're just going to live where they, they get well fed. So that's, that's what is important to remember. Are there any simple reasons why teenagers today suffer from chronic fatigue syndrome? Huh, good question. If someone's suffering from chronic fatigue syndrome, students, where are their cells running? Up here, look how much energy they're getting. So someone can suffer from chronic fatigue syndrome, mostly chronic fatigue syndrome is lack of oxygen and you can have a hundred reasons for lack of oxygen. One might be that the person's got yeast in their body. Another one might be chemical exposure. Another one might be lack of, lack of exercise, which is a powerful way to get oxygen into the body. Another one might be dehydration, because the, the cells need the water to help pick up the oxygen. Can you see there can be a whole lot of reasons? And too much time on technology and not enough time running up and down mountains and diving in seas. <coughs> okay, if you die in, Dive in the sea here, you're in there seven seconds, is that right? Wonderful tonic. Um, done that one. Um, if taking, I think it's opi opiates, um, what can be taken instead? Well, the detective hat has to be put on to find out why the person's taking those things. So you've got to turn the tap off, find out why they're taking it and uh, remedy the very reason as to why they were taken in the first place. Can you see that? Um, what can you do to heal the body from the effects of chemotherapy? I think Emily's story is a great story on that because she had three different bouts of chemotherapy. Chemotherapy does poison the body and the body must now be giving a healing environment an environment conducive for healing. God gave us an amazing body with the ability to heal and it will heal if you give it the right conditions. But be patient. There's a verse in Galatians 6 verse 7 it says, let us not be weary in well doing for in due season we will reap if we faint not. In other words, there's a time factor. Little by little by little. So I have seen people recover after chemotherapy but they need to be given the right conditions. In our health retreat, I've had two men come to our program in the last year who got depression six months after moving into a, a mouldy house. Can you see why their brains got depression? Because the brain cells are running out there giving two units of energy instead of the 36 units of energy. That's why understanding that explains so much. But I'll, I'll be covering that as I go through the lecture. We've done his potting mix killing people, done that one. What is hybridised wheat? Um, I'll be covering the hybridisation of the wheat probably mostly in the um, uh, diabetes lecture. What night's diabetes lecture? We got 
Tomorrow night. Okay, tomorrow night I'll be looking at the hybridisation of the wheat. If you can't come tomorrow night, there's a book called Wheat Belly by Dr. William Davis who covers it, covers it very, very well. So we've done that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. My husband is on numerous pills, always has chest infections. Can correct eating do that? Absolutely. Um, even when there's damage in the lungs, when you give the body the right conditions, one has to check on the breathing. You know, Florence Nightingale said that pure air is the first law of health. And there's a little book, I don't know if it's here tonight or might be here on another night, called The Ministry of Healing. And there's a section in there on the eight laws of health and the number one law is pure air. That's why you've got to check your rooms. Even in Invercargill, the window should be open a little. I, I like lots of warm on, but I like the fresh air. So make sure there's no chemicals, there's no mould, the carpets must, must be careful on carpets. So the, the freshest of air. One thing that causes a lot of mucus is dairy but also the hybridised wheat. Can you get wheat that's not hybridised today? It's called spelt or kamut. It's a very sad story here. I'll just go over it very quickly. 16-year-old um, getting braces. The orthodontist drilled into the tooth. Had pain for two years during treatment in tooth. Swollen face, temperature. Uh, because the hole in the tooth, there was a hole, so they tried to do a root canal four times, packed it with antibiotics, finally the tooth had to be taken. Very sad story, isn't it? So also lost bone behind the tooth, two months still infected, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Very sad story. Um, many people are sick because of what's happening in the mouth. So basically what you've got to give now is the right conditions for healing. And you can do poultices in the tooth. You can do tiny little charcoal and slippery on poultices. And you tiny little one and slip it down inside. You can do ginger poultices in there. And if you heard of oil pulling, oil pulling is putting coconut oil in your mouth and swish, 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 swish. And after about 10 minutes you spit it out and that can make an environment in your mouth that will kill the microbes. So there are a few things that, that you can do. Um, exercise is very important. You know, one of the best exercises is those little trampolines, just jigging up and down. Because if there's swelling or soreness in the mouth, running, <laughs> it's going <laughs> to hurt it. But that, that little jigging is very good. And, and your lymphatic system is your vacuum cleaner of your body. And when you're on those little mini trampolines or lymphocytes or rebounders, three things come together. The three teachers, it's called gravity, acceleration and deceleration. I felt acceleration on the plane to get today taking off and deceleration when we landed and were braking. So on those little trampolines, you see strength comes by defying gravity and the best way to defy gravity is to jump. Yep, so you, you jump up and that's acceleration. And when you're right at the point, all your little gates in your lymphatic system open. And then you come down and you hit the mat, there's deceleration. They'll close again. And then they open, shut, open, shut. And so what happens is that, that jumping on the, on the rebounder, opening and shutting the lymphatic system, and your lymphatic system is the body's vacuum cleaner, so it's sucking all the waste out of the tissues. So for this um, young guy, the, the lymphocyzer would be, would be excellent exercise. Every home should have one. If you don't have one, you can go to, uh, we call it Gumtree, you probably don't have Gumtree, eBay, something like that. And a lot of people throw out their rebounders. One lady said, Barbara, I feel so terrible, I just threw out my rebounder. I said, it's all right, I know the lady that got it and she's really appreciating it. <laughs> just go and get another one. <laughs> Do you know why people get old? They stop jumping. We've got to jump every day. What do kids love doing? If you've got a rebounder in your room, guess where the children will be? So you'll have to wait till they're gone, then you can get on. 
So I think I've, I've uh, covered all of that. There was a question that one man asked, if the cells rebuild and are remade, why do we get old? <laughs> well, we don't live forever. And to answer that question, you have to go to Genesis 1.29 as to <laughs> that we don't have the tree of life anymore because of sin came into the world. But um, the human body will deteriorate, but when you give it the right conditions, you can slow that down. People are deteriorating far too young, far too young. But the human brain need never deteriorate, and on Saturday morning I'll show you how you can get younger with age. That's good news, isn't it? Well, thank you for your attention, and we're doing diabetes tomorrow night, young? Have we got the brochure? I think we're doing diabetes tomorrow night. Um, if you have diabetes, coming to this lecture will show you how you can turn it around and turn it around very quickly, whether you're type 1 or type 2. And if you don't have diabetes, come tomorrow night because you'll learn how you need never get diabetes. So I look forward to seeing you tomorrow night. Thank you for your attention.